If you haven't already, let's turn to Luke chapter 2, a message I'm entitled, The Promised Savior. And again, Lord willing, we'll look at the first 40 verses. If not, we'll at least read them uh, in their context. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember as a kid, uh, if you were to ask me, what is the Christmas story? I probably would have told you, well, it's about Santa Claus and the elves, and you want to be on the list. That's that's the nice list, not the naughty list. Um, and there's snowmen and reindeer. Um, and as I grew older... And I began to understand who Jesus was and got saved. I began to kind of look at the resources out there, such as uh, movies and, and things like that, that depicted the um, uh, nativity story, if you will. And, uh, and I found that there were some, some uh, interesting um, contradictions between that and God's Word. And so you, you probably recognize this scene. Uh, Bethlehem, around 2,000 years ago, Joseph and Mary arrive at a sleepy town in the middle of the night, and Mary's already in labor, and Joseph is desperately knocking on the doors, trying to find a place for his wife as she's on the donkey, and they find that there's no room for them in the local inns, and so they're panicking, and in desperation, he, he convinces this one guy that even a stable would work. And the guy goes, okay, great, we've got a stable here for the animals. Uh, why don't you come over here? And, and so, uh, reluctantly, the innkeeper allows him to use the stable for, for um, the giving birth to, the, to baby Jesus. And, and, uh, and there they are in the stumble-down uh, stable with the cows and the animals, and, and they give birth. What's interesting is that uh, uh, that's a problem because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches something uh, quite different. And I think true history has gotten choked out by myth and by stories and by plays as cute as they can be with kids in them. Uh, sometimes they're not biblically accurate. Um, by movies, and they've dramatized the event, I think, for the sake of entertainment. And so uh, this morning we're going to look at the real birth account, which is a little bit different. And so let's take a look at what Luke says and records for us in Luke chapter 2, picking up in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, uh, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. We'll pause there. That's typically as far as uh, pastors go on the Christmas story, but you'll see that we'll continue on and, and take a look at the rest of the story and what happens. Uh, but in verse 1, we see here, uh, we're introduced to a man um, named Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the Roman emperor. He was kind of like the king of the land. And he ordered that there be a census take place. And so we know that a census for us is a population. They want to know how many people are in their dominion. And, and he definitely wanted to know that. But he had another agenda behind that. He wanted a census so he could know how many people there were so he could tax them. And so his, his motivation was taxes. He wanted to tax the people. And he wanted more money. And so um, that was his motivation for the census. Yet God used it. God ordained it. And uh, God uh, used this to bring, we'll see in a minute, uh, Joseph back to his homeland. And Luke is very detailed. I love his 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 um, account. And both Luke and Acts, he gives us an orderly account. And we read here in verse 2, it says the census first took place when Canarius was governing Syria. And so if you take a look at the Greek word here for first, it's protos. It really could be translated before. So verse 2 could actually be translated. This was the census taken before Quinerius was Syria. So there were actually two censuses that took place. And Luke is telling us uh, this is that one. That one before, um, before the uh, uh, governor, if you will, of Syria uh, came into power and did his census. 
And so uh, we got this right timing coming in here. Um, again, Jesus uh, chose where to be born, when to be born, and his parents. And uh, we see that um, they're called to be registered to their own city. And so in verse 4, we see Joseph leaves Galilee out of the city of Nazareth where they were. And he goes to Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is how far away? Well, it's about 80 miles away. So it's quite a journey for them on foot. Remember, they don't have cars or bikes or trains or planes like we do. Uh, they've got camels and donkeys and, and two legs to get them there. So um, they had to go to Bethlehem, but why? Well, in verse 4, it tells us. It tells us because he, Joseph, was of the house and lineage of David. So they had to go there because Joseph, his ancestors, came through David. We looked at this last week that Mary's lineage also came through David. Um, but they had to go where the male, where his family came from. And so they had to go to Bethlehem. And what's fascinating is that in Micah 5.2, uh, which was written about 700 years before the birth of Jesus, uh, God had prophesied that the Messiah would be born in the little town of Bethlehem. And so God ordained that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. And lo and behold, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. So God is orchestrating all this taking place. And he's drawing uh, Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem uh, to be born there. And we see in verse 5 that um, they're, they're to be registered. And that Mary is his betrothed wife who was with child. Uh, we touched on this a little bit. Betrothal, it's, it's not quite an engagement, um, but yet it's a little bit more. Well, it's, yeah, it's a little bit more than engagement in our sense uh, because theirs was a year and you can be engaged here and sometimes it's more than a year and sometimes it's, you know, a week. So I guess it, it depends on your point of view there. But it definitely was a little bit um, an, a less than a marriage because uh, they weren't living together. They hadn't consummate the marriage. Um, and so they were still living separately um, and yet they were called to, to, um, to go together. And so Mary went with Joseph, and, uh, and we see that uh, Mary was with child. It's interesting the way that Luke phrases this. It doesn't say that, um, that Mary is with their child. It's with uh, child. And I think this is interesting because we have to remember that Joseph adopted Jesus as his own son. He's not the biological father. Uh, God the Father in heaven is Jesus' father. And so Joseph adopted him as his own. And I think this is interesting because uh, if you take a look at Genesis 3.15, God prophesied that the Messiah would come and be a part of us. He'd enter the human race. But it's interesting because in Genesis 3.15 it says that he would come from the seed of a woman. And if you know anything about the human body, you, you know that uh, the seed comes from uh, the man, but there's also a seed in the woman. And those two meet together. And lo and behold, you got a baby. Uh, but what's fascinating is that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy and that he was the only person who was not conceived uh, by a seed of a man. He's the only one who was conceived by the seed of a woman. So Jesus is fulfilling scriptures left and right. Again, there are over 300 scriptures uh, that he fulfilled in the Old Testament that point to him. And so, uh, uh, in fact, all the Bible is about Jesus, really. And you can see that as you study and, and get to know the Lord more and more as you read his word. Well, in verse 6, we see that it says that, uh, so while it was that they were there, so... Um, uh, that the days were completed for her to be delivered. And that's interesting the way that Luke phrases this, days to be completed. It really suggests that they were there in Bethlehem before she went into labor. I know when you uh, see uh, you know, the portrayal of them going into Bethlehem, she's about to give birth and they're frantically knocking on the doors. But this really suggests that they were there before. And I think if Joseph uh, is a just man, which is what the word tells us, he would know it's not safe to travel when your wife is about to give birth. That would be a very dangerous journey. So most likely they got there way before time. Um, so he's not, you know, trying to find a place for them. We see in verse 7 that um, 
she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And this is another misconception here with this inn and this innkeeper and all of that that takes place. The word here for inn is, in the Greek, it's kataluma. And it's not what we think as an inn. I really think it could be better translated as lodging place or even better guest room. And so, uh, as the census is taking place, uh, many of Joseph's relatives have already gotten there before him. And they are already in the guest room of the house. And so... um, There's no room for them in the guest room. And so they have to figure out what to do. And what's interesting is this word is actually used in Luke chapter 22, verse 11, when Jesus talked about uh, the guest room, the upper room, that the disciples would be with Jesus for the Passover meal. So very often they would have a room downstairs where the family would stay and they'd have a, a guest room upstairs. And then underneath that guest room there would be a, a lower area where they'd have their animals. Uh, so they'd have the family animals there. And that's most likely where uh, baby Jesus was born, was in that lower area with the animals. Um, so a little bit different than the, the mindset that we get um, You know, he wasn't turned away from the hotel. Um, Joseph just found that his relative's house was already filled with guests. And so they were trying to figure out a place to put them. And, you know, the closest thing I can think of, um, you know, we really don't have anything like that. But the animals would have been their transportation, would have been uh, also uh, their provisions. So I guess it's kind of a mixture between, like, the kitchen and and the garage, if you will. That's kind of where they were kept. Um, And so they uh, stayed there. And uh, we see that this is where Jesus chose to be born. Again, the humility of the creator of the world coming to this earth. Could have been born in a palace among the kings. Uh, Could have been born in a hospital that's sanitary, where people wash their hands before they come and and touch the child. Yet we see he's born in uh, a stable, this this manger, if you will, where the animals are. And um, as we press in, we'll see uh, even just more of his humility of coming to rescue us. So let's pick up in verse 8 through 20. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made known widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. We'll pause there. So we see uh, here in verse 8 that God comes and he, he uh, enters the scene. And, and the father, being a proud dad, wants to announce the birth of his son. And, and who does he, he bring the angels to, to tell? Uh, shepherds. Uh, and in our culture, we don't really understand this, but uh, historically, um, shepherds were the lowest of the low. Uh, they were uh, stingy, they were uh, not to be trusted, um, they were dirty and smelly because they're sleeping with the animals out in the cold. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it was um, kind of like a bum, if you will. I mean, they were, they were the guys you didn't want to be around with. And yet, God the Father chose to go to them first. Uh, and so, it, again, it just shows the humility uh, of the Lord. 
to go as low as he can to reach those at the bottom of the barrel and to, and to share the good news with them first. And I'm grateful that he's done that with us. <laughs> Sometimes we can think we're not that low and we realize, no, we were pretty low. And God wanted to let us know that he loves us and rescue us. Um, and so we see the angels come, and in verse 10, they tell them, uh, do not be afraid. And I find that fascinating because, uh, again, uh, the angels wouldn't have been instructed to say this uh, if they weren't afraid. So God knew their hearts. God knew, hey, when you guys go and you, and you tell them the good news, they're going to be afraid. So make sure you say, hey, don't be afraid. And, again, the Lord knows our hearts. He knows what we need. And, and so he encourages us through them as well to not be afraid. Uh, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. So uh, they shouldn't be afraid because there's good news, uh, good tidings of great joy. Uh, the good news is the Messiah has come. The long-awaited Messiah that they've been waiting for to rescue them, redeem them, has come. And Jesus, the Messiah, and uh, that he's going to go to the cross and, and die on the cross for our sins and be buried and then raised again the third day. And, and so this is the good news. This is glad tidings, which is going to be for some people. No, for all people. So again, uh, the gospel message is for everyone. There's a group of people that want to say that there's a limited atonement and that Jesus died for an election, uh, elected few of people. And uh, if you join their club, you can be one of them. Uh, I'm sorry, but the word of God is so clear. John 3.16 and other places. And, and we see even here that the gospel message is for all people. It's for everyone. Whoever would come to Jesus may receive everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. So it's the good news that these shepherds can be saved as well. And he tells them in verse 11, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So uh, Jesus was born in the city of David. And at first glance we can think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't David rule and reign in Jerusalem? I mean, that's kind of where he set up uh, his, his uh, palace, if you will. Isn't that where uh, the city of David is? No, the city of David is where he was born. And so the city of David is, is where David was born, which is Bethlehem. So it's this great foreshadowing that uh, this earthly king, David, came and ruled and reigned, and he was born in Bethlehem, but that a future king was going to be born in the same place to rescue and redeem us. And so uh, uh, he would be born in Bethlehem. Which is also a fascinating study. If you take a look at the word Bethlehem, um, it means house of bread. And so we know Jesus as the bread of life. Uh, and that's why we, we also partake of communion, is that that bread represents his body, which was broken and beaten for us. And so here, here comes the bread of everlasting life into the city of bread. And to freely distribute bread to everyone, the free gift of salvation. And so Christ has come. And uh, we read right here, it says that he is Christ the Lord. In verse 11, he's not only a Savior, but he's Christ the Lord. And so, again, Christ is um, the name Christos, and, and, and that's the, the Greek New Testament, the Old Testament Hebrew. It's Mashiach, Messiah. Uh, it's the anointed one. So he's the promised one. He was the anointed one. Jesus is the one who uh, is to come and to, to die and, and to take our place and, and to uh, bring us back in fellowship with the Lord. So Jesus is the, he's the Christ. He's Christ the Lord, the Messiah that they had been waiting for to rescue them and be their king, and he's our Messiah as well. He's our king. And what's interesting is that these angels tell him uh, in verse 12 that this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And at first glance, we can think, wait a minute, this is the sign. Well, how is this really a sign? I mean, if you've ever been around babies, yeah, you, you swaddle them in clothing and, and you know, you put them in some sort of kind of a, a manger or some sort of a crib, um, some sort of a, you know, a little container. If you've been in the hospital, they've got this little container you put um, the baby in uh, so they don't roll around and fall out and they can keep an eye on them. So we can think, well, how is that really a sign? What's fascinating is the word here for manger um, really could be translated cattle crib 
a feeding box for cattle, a feeding trough, or a stall. So how many babies do you think in Bethlehem would be born in the feeding trough for the animals? Probably not very many. Uh, you know, you really wouldn't want to put your child in that sort of environment. Um, let alone, uh, you know, next to the animals. I mean, it would be dirty and smelly. And, and yet Jesus chose for himself to come and be born in that environment. Uh, to identify with us in our sinfulness, our need for a Savior. Um, and so it's such humility of, of Christ coming and being born in the way that he, he chose to be born. Uh, to identify with us, to, to, to rescue us, and uh, to redeem us. And so uh, he was born, and uh, we see that as the angels are sharing this uh, message in, in verse 14, that uh, the whole heavenly host comes with them and, and praises God by saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So this is a new message that's being proclaimed, uh, that on earth now there's peace and goodwill toward men. Uh, peace. As so many uh, of the wars and fighting on the, on the world, uh, on this earth, um, that there's really been a very small time of peace. Um, in fact, you take a look at history, it's almost throughout all of history, there's been some sort of war going on in the world. Yet peace is coming, and peace is being born, the Prince of Peace. Uh, but not only that, one who would bring goodwill toward men. Um, and Jesus is full of goodwill because he's the only one who is good. Um, the Bible says that there is no one good, no, not one. That we've all fallen short of the glory uh, of God. We've all fallen short of, of, his, of his goodness, of his grace. And so not one of us are good. We're not perfect. Um, there's only one who is good, and that's Jesus Christ. And so Jesus always did that which pleased the Father. I so wish I could say that, that I always do those things that make God happy. Um, just as I, you know, wish my son would always do those things that please me. <laughs> uh, I wish that I could, I could, you know, do that for my, for my father in heaven, but I fall short. Uh, but I'm so grateful that he forgives me, gives me a second chance and a millionth chance, um, and that he loves me. And so it's through Jesus Christ that we can have goodwill, that we can have that peace. And so uh, Jesus came to bring that and to, uh, to come and enter into our hearts and our lives. And we see in verses 15 through 18 uh, that the shepherds, they went with haste, it says, which means they had no time to lose. They wanted to come and find Jesus and see him for themselves. And then we see the shepherds went and told everyone the news that the Savior of the world had been born. And we just recently had our second child born, and I was trying to imagine this, uh, people coming into your little space with your child, and, and who is it? It's shepherds, you know. They didn't have antibacterial sanitizer back then so I'm sure the shepherds had stuff on their hands and probably wanted to hold the child or even getting that close and um, and so here they are they're they're you know next to Jesus and um, as I was thinking about this I was just reminded that you know here are the shepherds coming to see Jesus yet Jesus says that he is the chief shepherd I mean, he's the best shepherd of all. He's the good shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep. So these shepherds are coming to see the ultimate shepherd, uh, this baby that was born in the most humble of ways. And then they go and they tell everyone the good news that the Savior has been born. And I think what an awesome opportunity to, to, to proclaim the good news uh, that the Savior has been born. And yet again, God chooses the low. He chooses the lowest, uh, those who would, the society would, would consider the least, the lost, and the, and the last. And God uses these shepherds to go and proclaim the good news. And uh, they go out and they tell people, the Messiah has been born. Come and see uh, come and see uh, what has happened. Come and see the, this child, the, the Messiah, has been born. I love in verse 19, uh, Mary's response. It says, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So Mary kept these events in the back of her mind. She knew that, that Jesus was special. She knew that he was the Messiah. But it, she didn't know how it was all going to go down. She didn't know really what the future uh, held for, for Jesus and, and his timeline. So she knew that he was God, but didn't know um, 
how this was all going to un- unravel and be fulfilled in Jesus' lifetime. So she, she's pondering this. She's kind of storing it in her heart, knowing uh, God is in control, and sometime uh, He's going he's gonna to rescue us. And we'll touch on that as we take a look at them going to the temple in just a few minutes. Um, but in verse 20, we read that the shepherds returned so they returned to their, their sheep and where they were before. And it says they were glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. So by faith, the shepherds obeyed. By faith, they went and they found the Messiah. And the same is true with us. By faith, we go and we see that Jesus is the Messiah. We, we put our faith and our trust in Him. And, and these guys, um, they left after seeing Jesus. They were glorifying and praising God. And I thought, man, that's really the response that we should have over Christ being born, uh, you know, physically uh, in this world, but then also uh, coming into our hearts and causing us to be born again. We should be glorifying God and praising Him for the work He's done um, to save us and the work He's doing in us right now to continue to, to draw us closer to Himself and make us more like Him. So we want to have that mindset of glorifying God and praising Him uh, because Jesus uh, came. He came on a rescue mission. If you know anything about a rescue mission, um, it can be dangerous. And you're not always sure if you're going to be able to rescue the people that you're seeking out to rescue. Yet Jesus came on this mission to rescue us. He was born fully knowing that he was going to go and going to die for us. And that was the only way he could rescue us. And so if you knew that you were going to be a part of a, a SWAT group to go and rescue someone, and you knew ahead of time that you're going to die on that rescue mission, but you're going to save the people that you're rescuing, would you want to go? Yet Jesus chose to go on this rescue mission, knowing full, fully well that he was going to die to rescue and redeem us. And so God loves us. I, I, you know, I know some people have this, this mindset. They think that God is a, a God of wrath and he's going to you know, strike them down with a bolt of lightning. And uh, you know, he's just ready to give them a swat on the back when they blow it. Uh, but the more you read the scriptures, you realize God is a God of love. I mean, that's what the scriptures declare. He loves us. He wants fellowship with us. He wants us to, to have that intimacy, that personal relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. So the shepherds leave, and uh, we'll pick up in verse 21 through 40 and take a look at Jesus then being presented in the temple. Verse 21. And when it when eight days were completed for the child, uh, for excuse me, and when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord: Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord: a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. <coughs> And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother Mary marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed." Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phinuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with 
a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for the redemption in Israel. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So much here, and we'll, we'll uh, kind of dive through it as we take a look. Um, but in verse 21, uh, here we see that um, it was eight days were completed, and that they were going to circumcise uh, Jesus. And so... Um, this was a part of the Old Testament law that every male child had to be circumcised. And so Jerusalem at this point from Bethlehem was about 5.5 miles away. Uh, so it's possible that they went there. I think more likely uh, what's possible is that the circumcision for Jesus probably occurred in a local synagogue in Bethlehem. And I believe that because then you take a look at the next verse in 22 and it says, Now when the days of purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So it seems more likely that Jesus was circumcised there uh, in Bethlehem, either at the local synagogue or that a, a priest came in and circumcised him. Uh, very similar to John the Baptist, that's what happened to him. And so uh, we see then that um, they were going to, to, uh, to the temple. Um, they were going to present him in Jerusalem to the Lord. Uh, and so it says the days of her purification here in verse 22. And that refers to the Old Testament again, to Leviticus chapter 12. And you can take a look at those first eight verses. Uh, sometimes we read Leviticus and you want to just kind of keep going and skip through some of that. Uh, but there's some beautiful stuff there in Leviticus as well that points us to worshiping the Lord with a pure heart. And so in this section it was talking about uh, a woman and it, had, uh, it mentioned that she had to wait 40 days following the birth of her son to finish her purification. So Jesus was about 41 days old when Joseph and Mary brought him uh, over here to Jerusalem and to go into the temple to offer a sacrifice. And we see here in verse 23... Um, that this is be, again being quoted from the Old Testament that every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and, and to offer sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons so they went to offer the sacrifice of two doves or, or two pigeons um, which would signify that they were poor the law required a lamb that a lamb would be sacrificed um, and yet they didn't have that lamb. And so uh, I think this is interesting because if you look at the timeline of all this going down, uh, if the wise men had really visited with their expensive gifts, they could have sold that and, and be able to purchase the lamb that was required for uh, the sacrifice. Um, yet the wise men didn't come. Uh, they would come about two years later. And if you read uh, Matthew chapter 1, uh, there, um, and then in a chapter 2, you'll see uh, that King Herod had ordered all the male children born in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, uh, to be killed. He was a very paranoid guy. After the, the wise men had left, he realized that he had been tricked, misled, and, and he didn't want there to be any king but him. And so he ordered his men to go to Bethlehem and, and uh, take out all the little boys that were two and under. So that suggests to us that... Um, that the wise men didn't come till about two years later. And so uh, I know a lot of us may have that nativity set, and we've got the three wise men there. Again, we're not even sure if there were three. We just know there were three gifts. Um, so if you want to be biblically accurate, kind of keep them away, and then two years later bring them in and include them in that little set there. Um, but they didn't have uh, a lot of money. You know, they were poor. And so, uh, yet the, the law had provision for them to come as well. God wanted everyone to be able to come and, 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 and give the sacrifice according to what was said in the law. And we see in verse 25 uh, that there's this man who has been waiting. 
His name is Simeon, and, and it says he was a just and devout man. He was waiting for what is called the consolation of Israel. And we see the Holy Spirit was upon him. So the consolation of Israel, what is that? Who is that? Well, again, after all those years, after all those centuries of waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled, um, here we see uh, Simeon, he's, he's coming and waiting for the Messiah. And, and now he gets to hold the Messiah in his arms. Uh, I mean, how blessed is he? And so Luke calls Jesus the consolation of Israel. And there's a famous Christian uh, carol. Hopefully we'll, we'll get to see later. And in that it says, The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. So Jesus came to, to bring... Um, uh, peace to the world. He came to, to draw us closer to the Father. He came to fulfill all the scriptures that were written about him. And uh, and Simeon was told that he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't die before he saw the Messiah. And I'm sure as an old man he was waiting and wondering when is this going to happen. And yet he takes Jesus in his arms and he's just praising the Lord that it has happened. That he gets to see salvation. He gets to depart in peace. And uh, and that this salvation is for all peoples, again, in verse 31. And I love what it says here in verse 32. It says, A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So, uh, you know, Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, he is... Uh, the one who is rescuing us, redeeming us. There's no uh, impurity in Jesus Christ. He's perfect. He's, he's the light. And he's come into a dark world, a world that is full of sin and, and evil, and he's come as the light of the world. Uh, he's come to rescue us. And it, it also says that he's come uh, to bring this revelation to the Gentiles. So a Gentile is anyone who is non-Jewish. You've got your, your Jews, and then you've got your Gentiles, your non-Jews. So uh, here we see that the gospel message is, again, for everyone, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. So Jesus is for everyone. And he's come to be our light. Uh, he's come to... Um, bring light into our hearts because our hearts are desperately wicked our hearts are dark so we need Jesus we need him desperately and um, Joseph and Mary have come they've come to bring Jesus according to the custom of the law we read that in verse 27 that is they, they've come to make an offering for the purification and to present Jesus to God um, that was required of the law. So uh, we see that the, in verse 33 that they're marveling at all these things taking place that have been spoken of him. Um, and then we see Simeon uh, turns to Mary, Jesus' mother, and says, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So, Simeon is giving uh, Mary this picture of uh, pain that is going to come her way. That it's going to feel like a sword is pierced through her own soul as she would see her son being crucified on that cross for her sins and for the sins of the entire world. Um, and I could not imagine um, watching one of my children suffer and die uh, for people. You know, let alone for, for evil people. Um, and yet Jesus went and he did that. He, he went to die. And on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So he was also praying that, that the centurions, you know, the, the Roman soldiers, that those um, who had been there and instructed to crucify him, that these Roman soldiers would, would put their faith in him as well. Even the religious leaders who were mocking him. Uh, he wanted everyone to receive this salvation. And so uh, he's saying that Jesus is destined for the, the fall and, and rising of many in Israel. Um, and Jesus kind of draws the dividing line. He says either you're for him or you're against him. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. There's no, well, I'm just kind of sitting on the fence. I like Jesus. I've seen all his movies. I've liked him on Facebook and I follow him. I got magazines. I, 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 I pray to him at the meal, mealtime. Uh, 
but I don't really know if I'm for him. I'm not really serving him. I don't really have that relationship with him. And Jesus says, well, then you're against him. And you think, well, I'm not against him. I mean, I'm not, you know, worshiping the devil. Um, but Jesus makes it very clear. He draws that dividing line. You're either for him or against him. And so many in Israel uh, would reject him as the Messiah, such as many of the religious leaders. But there would be some that would put their faith in him as the Messiah. And we see one of the religious leaders, Nicodemus, would do that. Um, and so Christ would come and uh, he would um, reveal the thoughts of many hearts. And when we look at Jesus and we look at the cross, um, you know, if he didn't have to suffer down that cross uh, for our sins, then we would think we're okay. Uh, our thoughts are pure, our hearts are pure. Uh, but when we look at the cross, we realize. Um, Man, we are sinful. Our hearts are, are wicked. We all sin and fall short of the, the glory of God. And so we realize that's really where we deserve, um, that we deserve to pay the penalty of our sin. We've broken the law. Uh, we deserve to pay for our crime. Yet Christ has taken our place. Uh, he's come to rescue us and redeem us. And so uh, it reveals that inwardly, um, our thoughts and our hearts are desperately wicked and we need a Savior. And it only, only we can turn to Jesus. He's the only one who can rescue us. And so uh, that's why we need a Savior. And so we've got the good news that Christ has come and suffered and died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. Yet the bad news is that we're sinful, <laughs> that we need to be rescued. Um, and not everyone likes being told that they're a sinner, but we're all sinners. Uh, we've all blown it. We've all made mistakes. And, uh, I mean, from the time that we're born, we're, you know, uh, telling our mom, you know, Dad said it was okay for me to have that cookie. Really? Let me go ask Dad. Well, Dad, did you say it was okay for him to have the cookie? No. Okay. Well, that's called a lie. You know, and so from early on, we don't teach our kids to lie and to steal and to misbehave. It's part of the sin nature. And so if, if God was to keep a record of all of our sins, uh, if we don't put our trust in Him, and some people, they're going to face that, that list would be huge. I mean, talk about three strikes, you're out. This would be like 30 million strikes, even beyond that, and you're out. And so I'm grateful that um, when we put our trust in Christ, that His blood is covered over all that list of our sins, that it's gone. You can't see Him. They're erased. And He looks at us and He just says, I see my Son, Jesus Christ, in you. Come on in. You're free. Come on into heaven. And so uh, I'm grateful that we have this forgiveness, uh, this everlasting life, this, this right relationship with the Lord. And so that we can uh, realize that our sinful condition, our need for Jesus to be our Savior. And then in verse 36, uh, we see that there's this gal named Anna, a prophetess. And she's of the tribe of Asher. And it says she's of a great age. And uh, my wife and I were discussing this, and I thought it was fascinating the way that they phrased this, of a great age. Um, because if you do the math, it says that she had been with her husband seven years from her virginity. Um, so, you know, maybe she was 13, let's say, uh, and then seven years would be, what, about 20. Uh, and then it says that this woman was a widow for about 84 years who did not depart from the temple. So you tack on 20 to 84, you know, so she's 104. That's of great age. I mean, Luke's not lying here. He's telling us the truth. And he does it in a very nice way. And so uh, as we get older, uh, I am learning more and more not to say that my uh, significant other, my wife, is old, but she is of great age. And so I think there's such wisdom there in that verse. Um, but it says that, that um, she served the Lord. She didn't depart from the temple, but she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And I love this picture. Here's this gal. She's elderly. She's well advanced in years. Um, and she's serving the Lord. Uh, and, and I think this is a great encouragement to us because it's telling me and it's telling all of us, you're never too old to serve the Lord. And I think on the flip side of that, you're never too young to serve the Lord. You've seen us allowing our kids to help with set up and tear down for the church services. Uh, we allow them to help us at home and we allow them to participate in communion with us. Uh, Jesus said, let the little children come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So 
I don't believe you're too young to serve the Lord, to spend time with the Lord. I don't believe you're too old, uh, well advanced in years, I should say, of great age to serve the Lord. And so God wants us to, to all be able to come and, and serve Him. And I think we can feel uh, defeated by the enemy to think, well, it's over, uh, you know, my life is spent and I've really got nothing to offer the Lord. And the Lord goes, great, you're at that point where you realize now that you're broken that you can really be used by me. Because it's not going to be about you, it's going to be about what I'm going to do in you and through you. And I'm sure Moses felt that way. You know, the first 40 years, he had spent a life um, taking care of uh, things there in, in Egypt. And then the next 40 years, he got the uh, back of the desert degree taking care of sheep. And by 80 years old, uh, he's thinking, I'm not going back to Egypt to tell them, let my people go. He's obedient, he goes, and then we find out for another 40 years, they're wandering in the desert. You know, And yet, he's continually serving the Lord. So we've got great examples in God's word for us that no matter your age, you can serve the Lord. And we see that uh, that Anna, she is serving God with fasting and prayers night and day. And so often we think to serve the Lord means we've got to go on the mission field. We've got to go to Africa and, and help the people there. Or, you know, we need to be doing something physical, some sort of work, some sort of action, so that people can see that we're serving God. I love what she's doing. She's just fasting and praying. She's spending time with the Lord. She's having that intimacy. She's really getting to know that uh, that God is her father, but also her husband. And she's got this closeness, this relationship with Jesus. And it encourages my heart uh, because sometimes uh, as a guy, I want to do something. I want to do something for the Lord. And the Lord's reminding me, just sit. Just sit there and listen and pray and, and spend time with me. And and. By doing that, we can serve the Lord. Uh, fasting is, is just uh, removing that obstacle that's getting in the way between your relationship with the Lord. Uh, food is a great uh, motivation for that. If you go without eating for a while, you'll be motivated to pray, to cry out to the Lord, uh, to get things resolved between you and Him, to seek direction. Um, but you can really fast from anything, anything that's going to hinder your relationship with the Lord. And then pray um, to seek the Lord, uh, to worship Him, and, and to seek direction, but also to give the glory that's due His name. And she does this both night and day. And I think, what an example to us. Um, and again, it's a reminder that until God calls us home, He's not finished with us uh, until He calls us home. And so God can continue to use us to be His hands and His feet to this world. And... Uh, and we see that Anna comes and she, uh, again, is looking for the redemption in Israel. And that's Jesus Christ. And she's praising the Lord. And so when all this stuff had happened, we see in verse 39, uh, that it had been performed according to the law of the Lord. Then Mary and Joseph returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. And the child, that's Jesus, he grew and became strong in spirit. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time that we can take a look at your word and and draw in closer, Lord, to the real story of Christmas, that we can see that you are the promised Savior. You've come to bring joy to the world, that you've come to bring peace and everlasting life, that we can have a relationship with, with God, the God who knows everything and created everything, that we can get to know him personally, and have a personal relationship with you, Lord, through the sacrifice of your Son. And I'm so grateful, Lord, um, that you've come and you've lived the perfect sinless life, Jesus. That you never sinned once. You never broke any of the Ten Commandments. That you've lived perfectly. And that you were that perfect, unblemished Lamb that went to, to be the sacrifice for our sins. And that upon that cross, not only did you cry out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But then you cried out... It is finished, paid in full. Lord, we are so thankful that we don't have to work for our salvation or try and, and, and do something for our salvation. Yeah, I, Lord, I know that if we try to work for it, we try to maintain our salvation. And, and we have that fear of losing our salvation, as some teach. Lord, we're so thankful that it is finished. <laughs> that the redemption, that the rescue mission has been finished that you, you've redeemed us and rescued us. And all that we have to do is look to you, 
uh, to come and to see you, to put our trust in you, and that you'll come and dwell within us and be our Emmanuel. And Lord, as Christians, we are excited that we just get to celebrate uh, this closeness that we have with you, that you came near, and that you came so near that now you dwell within us, and that you want to change us and transform us to become more like you. And Lord, I pray that if there be those here today who have not surrendered their life to you, um, that they would do that this morning. I know many have heard of you, and maybe even have heard of your love, yet they refuse to, to give place in their hearts for you, Lord. And we're reminded that our culture tells us to be happy and to seek things for ourselves. And Lord, some meaning people are just trying to, to amass a fortune for themselves or they're too preoccupied with their hobbies and they've got no room for you in their hearts. Lord, I pray if there be any here this morning who, who needs to allow you to come into their hearts, uh, that they would make room, Lord, that you would come and you'd clean house, that you'd change them and transform them. And so if you're here this morning, I want to encourage you, what could be more important than allowing Christ to come in and dwell with you? Revelation tells us He's knocking at the door. He's seeking to come into your heart, to change you and transform you. And if that's you, I want to just encourage you to pray this prayer with me, and you will be born again. Not on my word, but on God's word. Because He says that if you repent, you put your trust in Him, you will be born again. So if that's you, I want to just encourage you to pray this prayer along with me. Lord, I realize that I am a sinner and that my sin has separated me from you. And I realize that you're not angry at me, but that you love me. And that this is why you've come, that you've sent your son Jesus to be born, to live the life I could never live, then to go to the cross for my sins, to be buried and then raised again the third day. Lord, I want to put my faith and my trust in you. And I want to receive this everlasting gift of, of, of everlasting life. I pray that you would forgive me of all my sins. That you would come into my heart right now and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I want to receive your Holy Spirit. I pray you just fill me and seal me with your Holy Spirit. Use me for your glory. And help me to live in a way that pleases you. I thank you so much for loving me. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for being my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. And I pray that in this new year that I would just live for you and grow in this new relationship that I have. I love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you pray that, I want to encourage you to come let me know or let somebody know that you gave your life to the Lord this morning.